right along with what I want to speak to you about this morning. And that is, I want you to think for just a moment about the price of love. Now, I'm not talking about putting it into the value of a dollar. I want you to think about it bigger than that. What is the price of love? And a lot of times we, we think about all the things that are going on in the world that we don't like. I mean, they say that bad news travels faster than good news, don't they? I mean, bad news sells newspapers and feel-good stories just make everybody go, oh, okay, great, now what? <laughs> Sometimes it seems like we thrive on the, on the bad news. But there's a reason for that. So many of us live thinking to ourselves, when is the next shoe going to drop? When is the bad stuff going to happen to me? And some of us just live that way. And I know that that is a, a deceptive trap to fall into. We, we sometimes are looking for the things that are going to go wrong. But when we talk about love, and we talk about the price of love, it gives us the hope we've been talking about, the joy we've been discussing, the peace that passes all understanding. Because love is at the center of everything that the universe is and ever will be. And this word that we're talking about this morning is not just a word that describes a feeling or an emotion. It's not just a word that describes how we think about each other romantically. It's a word that describes to us, as amazing as this might sound, a road marked with suffering. Because when you think together deeply with me about the price of love, you know that if you're going to love something, it's probably going to hurt at some point. As a matter of fact, I don't think anybody has truly loved anything or anyone without there being a sacrifice involved. Something that they had to look past. Some fault that they had to overlook in someone else's life. Something that they said or something that they did. Something that happened that hurt them because they loved and I want us to look at a peculiar verse this morning as we think and talk about love. I want us to look back to the prophet Isaiah. And I want us to look at Isaiah chapter 53. If you have your Bibles or you're following with us along online, for those of you that are coming to us uh, in our service online, thank you so much for being here today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53, and we're beginning reading in verse 4. And as we think about the price of love this morning, I want us to think about this scripture. An unusual verse, perhaps, to think about right before Christmas, right before the birth, right before the celebration, right before the joy and all the things that go along with a new baby coming into the world. I want us to think deeply this morning about the price of love. And in verse 4, it says, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed, or in the old King James, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. And I want to just stop reading there for a moment, and I want you to think again with me about what I asked you at the beginning. What is the price of love? And when I thought about that, and I thought about what that means... 
I thought about what are the essential components for us to be able to love something or someone. And one of the most basic things that you need to have in order to really love someone is the ability to choose to love them without somebody telling you you have to. Imagine if the person that you loved, you only loved them because you had to. Now, some of you who've been married a while are saying, yeah, well, that's, that's true, yeah. <laughs> I used to love you because I wanted to, but now i got to love you because I have to. <laughs> so don't tell me that thought wasn't going through your mind. <laughs> but we all know that as love matures, that it becomes more than it was at the beginning. We have some couples here that have only been married for a few months, not less than a year. And your love is wonderful, it's great, it's spicy, it's hot. <laughs> and some of you have been married for 40 years and you're sitting here today and you're saying, well, my love is not quite as chaotic as it was when it started out, but it's deeper and more grand in ways that it could never have been at the beginning. Those young kids, they think they know they're in love. They're not in love yet. They don't even know what that means yet. <laughs> and yet in all the stages of how we love people and how we look at love, there, there's an important element of these verses that comes to us in a road marked with suffering. Because even though the basic component of our ability to love somebody is the ability to choose them, and to love them because we want to, it also opens the door for the possibility that we will not make the right choices. <laughs> that we will walk away from the best of who we are. That we will walk away from the best of who God wants us to be. That we will walk into our own path of selfishness and, and throw away all of the things that God wants to bless us with for our own selfishness and our own desires. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to our own ways. There's not one person who's ever lived in the world who hasn't gotten off course. It doesn't say some of us have gone astray or most of us have gone astray. It says all of us. And the price of love is the ability for us to choose that which is not best for us. In a sense, the price of love is God allowing evil to exist in this universe. In a sense, the price of love is God allowing us to be able to choose and knowing that when he gave us that choice, that we were not going to live up to our best. Knowing that when he gave us that choice, that from the foundation of the world, he was going to have to have a plan of salvation that included the very best of heaven, coming to earth to show us what love truly looks like. And knowing that from the promise of Isaiah, who lived 700 years before Jesus came, in the middle of a chaotic time, in the middle of war and, 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 and famine and disease and plague and all the things that Isaiah saw in his lifetime, yet before the throne room of heaven, he saw a God who loved his people and was going to not just leave us where he found us, but give us a path towards love and hope and joy and peace that would transform everything about who we are and what we are. You see, the price of love is a very, very, very high price. Because it took Jesus coming to show us what love really looked like. To restore us to the best of what heaven offered. And to give us a path towards a better future. And if I think about what love really means, love is a promise. Love is a promise for the hope of a better future. Imagine a world without hope. Hope is love's promise. Uh, all of us here today are not promised 
as the old song says, God has not promised skies always blue, flowers strewn pathways all the way through, but he's promised strength for the day, light for the weary. And so when we look at the power of love in our lives, the source and the promise of hope is knowing that God loves us, knowing that there's something there beyond just the physical world that we can see, beyond the stars that have been thrown into space and beyond all of the planets that have been strewn across our galaxy. There's something bigger and there's something more than just the matter that we can see, that there is something beyond that at the essence of it that tells us that we were made for something better and made for something more, and that our lives are not just over here, but there's something beyond all of this that gives us the hope of a better future. That's God's love to us and for us, living itself out into the eternity that he has promised us. And then there's the promise not only of hope, but there's the promise of joy. I don't think it's possible for you to experience the love that God has for you and also not experience his joy. They are inextricably connected to each other. The joy that God wants to bring us. And the scripture says it this way when it says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and despised its shame. You see, the joy that Jesus came to give us involved looking forward into time to each one of us and knowing that his love was going to be received by everyone sitting here today and everyone watching online, that he knows and looks forward with joy to your salvation, to who you are and who he's called you to be and how you're going to live into the future, how you're going to love into the future, the kind of person you're going to become because You've accepted his love for you, and because of that love for you, you can love others and be the person that he's called you to be. That kind of joy that resonates at the very center of who you are. So that even as Jesus was walking towards the cross, even as he was being pierced for your transgressions and crushed for your iniquities, even the punishment that he had received as those whips came down on his back, We don't really understand the amazing torture that Jesus endured on that day. But we know that by those very stripes, those very wounds, we find our own healing. That the healing that he he offers us is is more than, than just a physical healing. So many times this scripture is used to say that God doesn't want any of us to be sick. He doesn't want any of us to suffer. That's absolutely not true. (laughs) As a matter of fact, there are some people that say, if God doesn't like poor people, then he must not like most of the world. (laughs) We We look around us today, and we are so blessed with all the things that we have, with all the things that we're a part of, with all the things that we celebrate coming. Listen, we are so blessed We have so much to be thankful for. And thinking about what it means to have the healing that God brings us more than just a physical healing. And and let me just stop here and say, I believe in physical healing. I believe God heals the sick. I believe that we can pray and be healed. Don't, Don't hear me saying that we're not. But I also know that I'm only here for a certain amount of time and then God's gonna heal every wound I've ever had. He's going to wipe away every tear I've ever shed. He's going to give me a promise and a hope that brings ultimate healing in every possible way. And so as we think about the joy that comes from knowing that, we can look forward with confidence and live into the peace that that brings. To know that the promise that Jesus brought us is a promise of peace. And you know something, that kind of peace cannot be overrated or understated. When you have that kind of peace, you've got something that the world can't give and the world can't take away. It's the kind of peace that comes 
when you're faced with an army of opposition and you've just got one 12 foot angel standing with you. <laughs> and you step back and you say, Well, Heavenly Father, I don't know how we're going to handle this. And I don't know how we're going to get through this. The obstacles are too difficult. And the maze is unseeable and unknowable to me of where the finish line will be in this maze of life. But because I've got you on my side and I've got the hosts of heaven with me, I am not afraid. Because at the genesis of peace is a confident trust in your heavenly Father's love for you that he is going to be there for you every step of the way. And so, as we think about that kind of confidence, it's, it's, it's not an illogical confidence. It's not an unfounded confidence. It's a confidence based on the foundation that Jesus was a real person. He was born to a real woman. He lived a real life. He died a real death. And he rose again in power and in strength and in victory to an everlasting life that he has kept for us as his disciples and is keeping for us until that day. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I'm quoting songs again. <laughs> it's just a part of who I am. It just comes out. <laughs> But I think as we look at that piece and as we think about that piece and we, and we back it up with Scripture and with what we're talking about, it's this road marked with suffering that we know that Jesus really loves us and has loved us and always will love us, that God loves us and has loved us and always will love us because of the price He was willing to pay. When love was born, we talked about it and sang about it a little bit earlier when it says, it tells me of a father's love who died to set me free. That's the kind of love we're talking about that brings the peace that we're talking about. And so as I think with you deeply about that, I think of the promise of love to this world, of unconditional love. The very worst of our humanity is found in our selfishness and in our greed. Because of our ability to choose, we are so often led astray by our own selfish desires. But as we choose wisdom and as we choose God's love, we find his peace and his joy and his hope. And that's the legacy that we leave to this world. This morning, as we celebrate that legacy, I want us to think deeply about the price of love that we're willing to pay in our own lives and our own relationships. What is the price that God's asking you to pay to truly love Him and love each other? What are the things that you might have to give up? What are the things you might have to do without? What are the things that you might have to sacrifice in order to understand God's love for you and how that's lived out into others? Because it's not an easy thing for us to do sometimes. I always say it this way, if loving people was easy, more people would be good at it. <laughs> That's not to say that you're not good at it, okay? I'm sure you're just getting God's applause every day for how you love the people in your life. But I can tell you from personal experience that I often don't measure up. I miss the mark. And it's something we have to work at every single day that we live. You are not as accomplished as you think you are at loving other people. <laughs> and, and the maturity and the growth is the same kind of maturity and growth that happens when you've got a couple that's been married six months or a year and a couple that's been married 50 years or 60 years. The difference in following Jesus and how that looks after you've been following Jesus for decades versus when you just started out. <laughs> Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he controls, since I gave my heart to Jesus, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love 
he bestows. Each day is like heaven. My heart overflows because the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Let me tell you something about this love relationship we have with our Heavenly Father. It's not just a myth from the dusty pages of a forgotten book that's nothing more than fables and stories. It's the essence of God's love lived out through us into everything that is and ever will be. Because the power of love that brings us together here today and the power of love that helps us to celebrate who we are and the best of who we are has only one source. And it's not the Hajj of Mecca. It's not the Buddhist temples in far-off Tibet. There's a story that comes to us down through the centuries of time the greatest story ever told that is unconditional love to each one of us. And it comes to us out of these pages that we've just read that are these words that are 2,700 years old now that come down to us from a prophetic word as he looked forward in time to a God who would see past all of the things we've done as we've turned to our own ways and done our own things, and lived our own lives, and loved our own ways. And he calls us gently back, not to a conquering king, but to a suffering savior. He calls us back through these moments that we live to learn once again what it means to love and be loved by our Heavenly Father. And I'm calling you back to that healing today. I'm calling you back to that restoration today. I'm calling you back to that salvation today. I'm calling you back to that love today to consider if God himself was willing to pay this price for love, how much more should we we be willing to give everything we are to live that love out in our own lives and to live that love into the lives of the people around us. There are many great people in our church today, many wonderful people, But I want to highlight one of those people at the conclusion of this service today. Somebody who's been coming to this church for a very long time. When I first met him and his wife, they were world travelers, traveling everywhere, going all over the world, having a wonderful time. I watched and went to the hospital as uh, the wife of this couple dealt with some serious physical issues, stood by the bedside, prayed with them. I was there the day that she passed away and went to heaven, walked into that room, sacred holy ground. Decades of marriage and love and life and laughter together. And I thought about the difficulty and the pain that comes when we love somebody and lose somebody. And all that goes along with that, over these past several years, I've watched this man struggle. I've watched him grieve. I've watched him cry. I've watched him confidently step on an airplane and travel again. I've watched him come back. And I've watched him faithfully serve God. Day after day, he comes to this church and he helps and he volunteers wherever he can. He does his best to move beyond the shadows of this world and the grief that goes along with this world and the pain that goes along with this world and reach out with hope and joy and peace and love to the God he serves and the community that he serves here at Hope. And this month is his birthday. And I always feel like the babies that are born on Christmas Eve kind of get a rough deal. You know, if your birthday's in June, it's not as big of a deal because, you know, you're kind of in the middle of the year, not a lot going on. You know, the June babies get all the best presents. But at Christmas, it's like, well, what am I getting you for Christmas and what am I getting you for your birthday? You know, when you've got a December birthday, you kind of get, especially Christmas Eve, you get gypped. Just not fair. And that's just how life is. <laughs> but the person that I'm celebrating with you today is here with us today. 
He was born in 1931. You do the math. He's seen world wars. He's seen a lot of history. He's seen a lot of things happen. He was married over 60 years. Raised a family. Did his best. And he's here with us today. And I told him I was going to invite him up to the platform at the end of the service to celebrate the power of love. And so I'd like for Hugh Hatch, if he would, to come forward at this time to celebrate you today. Sean, you want to help him? Sean, help him up. Yeah. For those of you that don't, don't know Hugh, this is Hugh Hatch. And Hugh's not the kind of guy that wants any limelight. He's not the kind of guy that wants me to make a big deal out of him. But he's here every day, almost every day at Hope Church doing something. And he's got a crazy ministry, not just here at Hope, but you'll find him at the local restaurants, Mama's and Papa's and In-N-Out Burger and Chick-fil-A. And they'd be sitting there with a whole pile of balloons in front of him. And he makes balloons for the kids when they come in. And I saw him down there at Mama's and Papa's just this week. And I didn't even see him. Well, I saw him first because he's got a pile of balloons in front of him. But as I walked in the door of Mamas and Papas, I saw one of his balloon wreaths, and I knew he was around. <laughs> and that's the kind of love we're talking about, loving into the community. Not everybody's going to know why Hugh does what he does or the motivations behind making balloons for the kids. Some people may not know your motivations. Some of you are school teachers. Some of you work in, in different places and do different things and all the things you do. People may not understand the motivations of why you do what you do, but your presence will be felt in the power of love that you bring. And I don't know uh, all the ways in which uh, God's going to continue to bless you in his life, but he's blessed him with 90 years this month. And I know that your birthday's not till the 24th, and I know today's the 19th, but we're not going to have a chance as a church, for those of you watching online, we're not going to have a chance to celebrate with you his birthday, on his birthday necessarily, unless you're here for the Christmas Eve service. But I just wanted you to know that this love that I'm talking about and how we serve God is good at every stage of life. For those of you just starting out your marriage lives, for those of you just starting out your lives together, and those of you that have been married for 50, 60, however many years, doesn't matter. It's this price of love, this sacrifice that we make to love the people around us that makes this world what it needs to be. And we're not going to find that anywhere else. There's not, this message is not going to be preached in any other setting anywhere in our culture. It's the church, it's us that must get this message out to the world that we live in. Did you know that 73% of the people who ever get married only get married once? Let's stop talking about all these people who get married and divorced nine times that are completely messing up my statistics. <laughs> There's a power in coming to church and loving your wife and your husband. There's a power in attendance at this place of sanctuary and this place of hope and this place of healing that is not going to be found anywhere else. You want your marriages and your love and your, and your lives to matter, connect with this love that I'm talking about. And so, Hugh, I'm going to ask Lester if he would to come back. And uh, I don't know how many of you watching online or those of you that are here today have December birthdays. If you would, if you have a December birthday, would you raise your hand? Oh, two more victims. I mean, <laughs> birthdays. <laughs> and you, oh, back there too. We got another one. All right. Well, we're going to celebrate with you today. And we're going to pretend it's June, okay? <laughs> no, we're glad you were born in December. Nothing wrong with December birthdays. But we just wanted to sing happy birthday to Hugh and to all of you. 
And immediately following the service, some of the men of our church are going to celebrate uh, with us. And, and Sean, would you bring that right behind you there? All right, so you got to have a cake, right? If you're going to have a birthday, you got to have a cake. So this, this, uh, this is a, a cake that says, uh, Happy Birthday, Hugh. And I didn't put anything on there. You know, 90 candles is kind of tough. Uh, so I got a nine and a zero down there that I'm going to put on here later. And we're going to celebrate with the men of our church and celebrate what it means to honor somebody who's paid the price of love. Somebody who's been faithful. Somebody who's been found faithful by our community and who is loved by our community. And uh, we're going to celebrate what it means to live a life that God can bless. So Lester, if you would, lead us out in a rousing round of happy birthday for all of our happy December birthdays. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear. Happy Hugh and everybody else in the December birthdays. Happy birthday to For those of you watching online, for those of you here today, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray your blessing over you. We thank you for the privilege that it is to serve you and to live for you. And Lord, you know the, the deep valleys that Hugh has walked through in these past years. You know the things that he's gone through, and yet you've been faithful to the promise of hope and joy, and peace and love. And Lord, we pray your continued blessing over him as he lives for you, as he does his best in these days that he has to be a blessing to others. Lord, all the little balloons that are all over town and all the kids that have enjoyed those balloons, we pray that there would be a, a legacy of love and life and laughter that comes from this man who serves you. And we ask your blessing over each one of us as we live for you, as we love for you, as we bring the hope and the joy and the peace into the lives of those we love in this Christmas season, help us to do better, help us to love better, and help us, Lord, to reflect on the price of love as we live into this Christmas week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each one of you. Have a great week.